the simple truth. That's what it's all about, isn't it? It doesn't have to be loud, it doesn't have to be brash, it doesn't have to be clanging cymbals, it doesn't have to be all this stuff. It's the simple truth of Jesus Christ and that there is a hope beyond what we see today. That we as a church, we're all going in the same direction together, we're all going to the same place together, we're going to take as many people with us as we can. That's what the church is all about. We want to reach a place. A place where there is a community that forever and ever and ever dwells in the presence of God. To walk the streets of gold that we see in the Bible. What that looks like, I have no idea. That new Jerusalem, when, the, when there's no more sun because God's light is enough for everybody. And the, there's a tree of life growing up on one tree, growing on both sides of the river. and all the, I mean, I just can't imagine what that is like. But I know for a fact that I want to see it. I pray you want to see it too. Whatever it looks like. In fact, if it looks like just a small little place when I get up there and all the grandeur I thought it might be, if God is there, if I see Jesus face to face, it's going to be the greatest place that I could ever imagine. But I have a feeling it's going to be a little nicer than that. A little nicer than that. So why do we worship? And how do we worship? See, we're created to worship that's, we were created to have a relationship with God. We were created to, to walk with Him in the cool of the day as Adam and Eve did. We were created to have this relationship that was personal and yet was within a group of people. God says it's not good for a man to be alone, so He created a woman because it's good for us to be together. In fact, Jesus gave His greatest commandment is one, two parts to it. It's not two different commandments. It's one with two parts to it. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Those two go together. We are made for relationship with God and with others. So we talk about being created for worship, to worship. Today we're going to look at the same passage we did last week, plus a few more verses. In Hebrews chapter 12, because worship is in community. And for us as a nation today, that's very important for us to understand. You see, the United States of America was built on this con concept of community. At the very beginning, groups of people came to this country. Groups of people started communities together, dependent upon one another to sur for survival. This entire country was built upon an understanding that there is a common good amongst a group of people, which is a community. I fear that in our society today we have lost that understanding of community, that understanding of a common good, that we are responsible for one another. We take our communities these days and we just say, well, that community, well, we subdivide our communities, we subdivide this, and even sub 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 subdivide streets. Well, that's their, their side of the street. This is my side of the street. That's not the way this country was founded. It's not the way God wants us to live. We live as a nation that is a community and supposed to be a community in Christ Jesus. We live as a church, as a community in Christ Jesus. But as a community, we have a, a calling to reach out and make the community even bigger and to change the actual community that lives around us. We were to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that all the world for us might be only as big as across the street. A lot of, our, our, a lot of ourselves at our age, at different places in our lives, our world's pretty small now. We only see fire for six people a day, for some of us. Others of us travel all over the world and do this and do that. And you see hundreds and thousands of people every, you know, every year. But the fact, wherever our world is, we take Christ into it. And we live it. And we love it. And we show it. That's what a community does. So we talk about worship is in community. We need to understand that this community begins with the community, with the, the unity that is God himself. The, tr the Trinity is a community. Three persona in one person. Three facets of, of one person. God the Father, God the Son, God the the Holy Spirit is the essence of what community is supposed to be. Three facets, but with one united person. One united purpose. Paul tells us that we are all different, but in Christ Jesus, we have one faith, united in one truth, in one belief, in one baptism. We have a purpose as a community that pulls us together in worship to God. So as we look at this passage in Hebrews today, chapter 12, verses 18 through 29... 
We want to backtrack just a little bit to Hebrews 12, verses 12 through 15. I want us to point out what it means to worship in community. What does it mean that worship is in community? We can worship all we want to, and I love worshiping by myself. When I, I'm by myself, especially on a, a, a cool morning and the sun's rising and being out there with the Lord is precious to me. But there's nothing like worshiping with a group of believers. There's nothing like worshiping in a community of faith where God is in control. And we put all of our differences aside and all our personalities aside and, and, and all the things that, that separate us aside and we become one in the power of the Spirit within us. Let's stand together as we read Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. The skipping over the verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to, to such a voice speaking words that, that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches this mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to, a, to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, into the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things. So what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence in all. For our God is a consuming fire. Dear Lord, we pray that you will speak to us today, that we will understand the wonderful beauty of independence in you that begins with dependence upon you. That, God, you will help us be the people you want us to be as we worship you in spirit and truth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Last week we saw that when we come to worship, we do not need to come in fear like the Israelites did when they came to Mount Sinai. We do not come to a mountain that is shrouded with smoke and flames and, and booming voices. We can come with, with great joy and anticipation we talked about earlier in, in the book of Hebrews. It talks about how, how God and Jesus Christ has split the veil that we can all approach the throne of grace with confidence, freely with confidence, knowing that God loves us, that we have a great high priest in Jesus Christ who is also the perfect sacrifice that allows us to approach and be together with God in relationship. That is a personal relationship, not one based upon sheep, that are slaughtered on the altar, but one based upon the lamb that was hung on the cross. This is our God. This is who we worship. We no longer come to this scary place, but we come with confidence to this place, this Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. Upon thousands and thousands and thousands upon angels are already singing and praising God together, worshiping Him. The church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven, those who have believed in the past and are, are, are now ascended in, are, are now with God in heaven. We have this picture here of, of, of we've come to God who is the judge of all men to the spirits of righteous men who made perfect. He is the, the judge of all men, but there are those who are there who stay true and, and honest and, and sincere, those who are righteous and made perfect in their death. These 
are the people we worship with when we come to God in community. No, we don't worship our ancestors. No, we do not worship. We don't worship the ghosts or spirits or anything like that. But realize when we gather to worship together as a community, we join in with the angels as we sing. We join in with those who have gone before us as we sing. As he tells us in chapter 12, this great cloud of witnesses that is cheering us on to run the race. He is, we join these in our worship with him. In a community that far ex expands and, and, and makes makes this entire universe look so small. We think about the church and those who have gone before us. It reverberates throughout all of the universe when God's people sing and they pray. The angels rejoice. God smiles. He hears us. He joins us. He walks with us right here in this place. We worship in community. Four verses I want to focus on, verses 12 through 15 that we read at the beginning. He says, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. You are, are not alone in all of this. You're not alone in this world. You don't have just you and Jesus. You do have you and Jesus, absolutely. But God created us to have others to help us carry the burden that will strengthen our arms and our knees, will help us with our, our, our needs. You know, even Moses himself could not hold the, the rod up high enough, could not raise his hands high enough and keep them up long enough. He had to have his men, uh, Aaron and Hur, to hold his arms up. We need each other. And so he tells us, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Use each other. Help each other. Love each other. Pray with each other. Walk with each other. Talk with each other. Meet each other in our needs. And get us through, get us through together to that great place we're going to. We're all moving in the same direction and we want to take as many people with us as we can. This is who we are. A community of believers. Also tells us that as a community we, we should make level paths for our feet. That the lame may not be disabled but rather healed. That, that we should not put boulders in front of people, obstacles in front of people to come to Jesus Christ. That we as a community should live in such a way and worship in such a way that anybody can join us in this worship, that anyone, whether they're, they're crippled with sin or, or lamed by, 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 by problems of this world or even physically lamed, we should not have any barriers to anyone who has any problems whatsoever to come to Jesus Christ and worship Him, to make the paths level for everybody. That everybody, for God so loved the entire world, not just a few, not just the Church of Nazarene, hate to break that to you, there's going to be more than Nazarenes in heaven, not just this church. God loves everybody. No matter where they were, no matter what they did. He went to the Pharisees. He went to the Sadducees. He went to the lepers. He went to the Samaritans. He went to the women of the, of the community that had no rights whatsoever. Every place he saw a need, he went and took care of it. And met it right where it was. He did not allow even the sins of a woman caught in adultery to be a stumbling block for her to find forgiveness and hope and life anew. He did not even take the woman at the well who had, who had been divorced five times, living with a man who wasn't married to, and she, he did not hold that as a stumbling block and said, oh, well, you've got a lot of things you've got to do before you can come to me. He says, I am he, the Messiah. I am he. And I will give you life. A water that you'll never need to drink again. A water that flows through you. And what does she do? She gets up and runs into the village and shares this beautiful message of Jesus Christ. He's out here. Come on. A woman who was despised and rejected by his own, her own community went to that community and spared herself to them and said, here is our hope. And the whole town was changed. The whole town was changed. So we're called as a, in community and worship that we level the paths for our feet and for all those who might come through our doors or those we might see each day. No matter how bad they are, no matter how much they've done in the past, no matter what they're doing right now, God still wants to save them and wants a relationship with them. He wants to heal them. He wants to bring them into a, a life that is, is self-fulfilling. He wants to bring them into a, a, a life that is, is filled with purpose and not just aimlessly going and doing things that are just so terrible. 
for them or for others. He wants to make a difference in their lives. And we're called to take this trust and this faith to them and level the road in front of them and bulldoze through all their excuses why they can't. Oh, I've, I've done so much, preacher, I, uh, God will never forgive me. I've done this, God will never do this for me. I've done so bad, I, I, I could never go to church. Oh, I've been so bad, my own parents won't even talk to me. I've been so bad, that I, my own church doesn't talk to me anymore. I've been so bad, I've done, I've done things that, 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 that people I, I grew up with won't even talk to me anymore. Oh, God doesn't love me. He can't possibly love me. And we're to go and bulldoze down all those things and say, I do. But better than that, God loves you. And he knows there's something better for you than what you have right now. And he knows that there's a hope in your life that you never knew of before. He wants you to know that there's a new start, a new beginning, a start over, if you will. No, all this in the past, the consequences are still going to be there. But you can have a fresh start in your life. And from this point on, live to the glory of God and make a difference in this world. You can do that. But we need to be willing to go in and bulldoze through those excuses. That's part of our worship as a community, to pray together as a people for all the loss that we know and all the loss that we don't know around us, that God would use us to make the level playing field for everyone, not, not to, to water down our, our beliefs, not to water down our, our, our understanding of life, not to water down anything about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but to show the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and not our own perspective that puts up stumbling blocks for other people. If you don't look this way, you don't talk this way, you don't dress this way, you don't do this, don't that, that you're not going to be welcome in our church. Get rid of them, is what he says. Get rid of those things. And let these people meet Jesus. Because he will meet them exactly where they are if we will take him to them, that they can trust him and believe in him. He tells us, as believers, make every effort to live in peace with all people and to be holy. This last phrase here, this next phrase here, has been misinterpreted so many times in the, in the church, especially in the, in, in the older church of Holiness Church. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord's. Sometimes we've used that as a stumbling block as a church. We have. We've gone out and told people that unless you're sanctified the way we think you're supposed to be sanctified, you can't go to heaven. The Bible says so right there. But the holiness that is spoken of here, this holiness is what I talk about every Sunday morning. That when we die to ourselves and we surrender our wills to God and we let God have control of us, this is the holiness he gives to us. It's the holiness that says, I no longer am my own. I fully belong to God, and I am now whole in the way he wanted me to be in the first place. In a relationship with him, in a community with the Trinity, with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and us. We are one with God, and we walk with God, and that is all that matters. It isn't about anything else. But then taking this beautiful picture of holiness, Taking this picture of, of oneness with God, of, of no longer fighting against God and, and arguing with him about doing this or arguing with him about doing that or, 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 or coming to him and saying, God, here's a problem. Here's how you need to fix it. You know, it is about coming to the Lord and saying, God, here I am with all my problems. Take them. Help me to make the right decisions in these situations. Help me to find the right place to go to. Help me to know the right thing to do. Help me to see people the way you see them. Help me to love people the way you love them. Help me, Lord, to, to get rid of my prejudices and my, my biases towards others. I'll be honest with you, I was raised in a town that was, was very prejudiced racially. I mean, very, very racist, r racial prejudice was, was terrible in my town. And in sixth grade, we had the first African-American family move into our town. We had two kids come to, to, to school, elementary school. In sixth grade, there, I, I, my first my first two African-American kids came to school. And by the time I graduated, the town was 50-50. And the stress and the, 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 the anger and the, the fighting that took place and, and the gym was split during lunchtime and the white people over here and the black people over there and we didn't mess with the other. It was awful. Didn't God have a good sense of humor sending us to Africa? 
when we were the minority, severely. After 4 o'clock, we were the only white faces for about 30 miles. God showed me what true love was because they loved us unconditionally. They loved us without fear. They loved us no matter what. And we grew to love them. And literally within two years, I never even saw a collar. I never even saw anything but a human being who was a fellow brother and sister in Jesus Christ. Someone who loved me and I loved them and we loved as a community like I have never known before in my life. That's what holiness is. Dying to ourselves. Letting the Spirit move in us in such a way that we no longer hold on to our prejudices, our preferences, our desires, our wants, our desires for control, our need for control, and manipulation. We just die to those. And when we do this, then we can truly worship in community and make a difference in our world. So finally he says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. That no one misses the grace of God. No one. That doesn't, I mean, that's not, that's not unequivocal. That's, that's not, well, maybe this one or maybe that one. May no one miss the grace of God. May no one not have an opportunity. May no one. That no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Dying to ourselves, understanding that we're part of something so much bigger than First Church of Nazarene in Fairmont, West Virginia. That we're part of a community that spreads across this globe. We're part of a community that, that far surpasses our own understanding. This past week in Indianapolis, as many as 20,000 Nazarenes were in one room worshiping. On a Saturday night, in the service that ended the mission, missions in my convention and began the district assembly, or, or general assembly, there was a special song sung, the presentation of Revelation song, and most of you know it even if you might not know the name. People from 22 different nations, 22 different languages are in this song. People we're about to see, we're going to see this video. People we're out to see are just normal folks like you and me. They're just regular Nazarenes. They're not professionals. They're not paid people. You tell some of them are pretty scared. Coming from small countries and standing on a stage with 20,000 people out there, they were scared. But what I see in this right here is a spirit moving through a community of faith that's far bigger than anything we could ever imagine. So let's just enjoy these next nine minutes of this video and see what God can do when we're willing to just let him have control.
language you speak tonight. Can we sing that together? Sing in your native tongue. Sing. Holy, holy, holy is our Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation, with all creation, I sing praise to. Everyone say hallelujah. 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 Amen, amen. Round of applause for these wonderful workers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I don't think we needed to understand every word, did we? We knew the Spirit. That's what worship in spirit and truth is all about. Not about what we sound like, what we look like. We are in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus alone. That's the beauty of worshiping in community. How about you? But that just, every time I hear that, it just uh, it kind of chokes me up. Especially when I heard that Arabic section in there, and I heard that singing before many times in Karak Church of Nazarene. is good. God is good. 